to stand before the Son of Man, to be translated at His second coming. Is that scripture? Turn to the left, Luke 21. Luke 21. Luke 21. When you're there, say ready. And I will read verse 36 for you. Luke 21, verse 36. But keep on the alert at all times, praying in order that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. A person that is dead in the ground cannot stand before the Son of Man. There is no power in heaven or earth that can accomplish the objective of experiencing justification by faith. And that's the second word that we're going to look at very, very briefly because time doesn't permit. We have been looking so far at justification as Jesus spoke to John the Baptist when he said, I want for you to baptize me. And John the Baptist says, you can't be serious. I'm not qualified to carry your sandals. And Jesus said, we must do this so that all righteousness can be fulfilled. And Jesus did so by his birth, life, death, and resurrection. And we now have a new title. It's an imputed title. Does that mean that I'm able now to live the Christian life because I have a title? No. Now we're going to look at the second aspect of justification or righteousness. In the English language, we have two words for nine usages in the, in the, in the Bible. And those words are justification and righteousness. But they all come from the root, same root word, dikado. All right. What is it about justification and the experiential aspect of it that will make justification, the legal aspect, a reality in my life? Well, the Apostle Peter said the topic of present truth. Get up for yourself later on. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. One of the founders of our church, the author of a little book called Early Writings, goes into great detail to describe to us what does present truth mean. Let me read it to you. There are many precious truths contained in the Word of God, but it is present truth that the flock needs now. I have seen the danger of the messengers running off from the important points of present truth to dwell upon subjects that are not calculated to unite the flock and sanctify the soul. Do we need uniting? Yes. Do we need sanctifying? Yes. If we don't focus on these topics of present truth, listen to the next sentence. Satan will here take every possible advantage to injure the cause. If we're not focused on what? present truth. Continue. But such subjects as the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days, the commandments of God, and the faith of Jesus are perfectly calculated to explain the past Advent movement, show what our present position is, establish the faith of the doubting, and give certainty to the glorious future. These, last sentence, these I have frequently seen were the principal subjects on which the messengers should dwell. Are you a messenger? What are we studying this quarter? Stewardship. Stewardship. <coughs> In Daniel 12, verse 4, God was not telling Daniel that in the time of the end, the progression of knowledge or the progression of biblical information would bring about great inventions like the automobile, the airplane, and the iPhone. <laughs> what God is saying to Daniel is that in the last days there will be a progression of understanding, of comprehension of the truth. That progression of understanding would be the result of Christ's work 
as the world's great high priest in the closing work taking place in the most holy apartment in the heavenly sanctuary. And if you're interested in reading this for yourself, I will give you some scriptures right now. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Hebrews 7, 25. And Hebrews 9, 26. I will read Hebrews 9, 26. Let me read Hebrews 9, 22 and 23 as an introduction to Hebrews 9, 26. Hebrews 9, 22. And according to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Why? Because God said so. That's why. <coughs> Twenty-three. Therefore, it was necessary, not optional, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens, that's the earthly, to be claimed with what? Animal sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. And what would be the result of Jesus conquering sin in my sinful nature? Now, Jesus can inspire the Apostle Paul to say in verse 26, but now, once at the consummation of the ages, He has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. What does that mean? Put away sin. Time is getting away from me, so I'm going to read to you. John 1, 29. Very, very important passage. It explains putting away. John 1, 29. The next day... He saw Jesus, this is John the Baptist. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin condition of the world. Hallelujah. I'm not talking about forgiveness of sins here, folks. It's talking about what Jesus took away ethically and legally at the cross. And that's what Hebrews 9, 26 is talking about. The putting away of the sin condition. It means a change in attitude, which brings about a change in character. Christ's bride has decided to make herself ready. For the first time in the long ages, the great controversy, the bride is now arrayed in the fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen, they are the righteous acts of the saints. Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8. That word righteous acts in the Greek is dikaioma, which means she is now fit. So the first usage of the word righteousness that Jesus spoke to John the Baptist about in Matthew 3.15 is talking about our title to heaven. Now, in Revelation 19, 7 8, the word righteousness is being used as our fitness for heaven. That fitness must take place here before Jesus can come back. Now we have a bride that is more concerned with Christ's honor and His glory than in her own salvation. Salvation is a done deal. The question is whether we're going to say, yes, thank you, or try to invent another way to be saved. That is the biblical definition of righteousness by faith. The bride now wants to overcome. Why? Because her bridegroom has overcome, and he's asked her to overcome. Is that scriptural? Yes. Revelation 3.21. She has now decided to crucify self with him, not by herself, with him. After a very, very long delay, the marriage of the Lamb can now take place. 
the judicial verdict of acquittal that took place at the cross when Jesus justified the entire human race must become a reality, must become an experience in a people that have been justified by faith and who believe in Christ, therefore the second half of John 3.16 can become a reality. They shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And I pray that that will be the experience of each one of you. That understand the meaning of the word justification. And it's nine different usages, and specifically in the three categories that I have very, very briefly shared with you this morning. Our closing hymn is number 335. Be patient with yourself. 335 is not a hymn that we are that familiar with, but the message is beautiful.